So Sterling, welcome to Inpit Lane. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Now, it's very hard to know where to start with a career like yours going back for so many, many years. But, but let's start, I mean, the motor racing connection started with your father. Your father raced at Indianapolis and Brooklands. What are your memories of that? Well, my memories, of course, I did, didn't see my father race at all. I mean, in fact, he gave up racing when he married my mother because she said, I'm not going to be married to a racer or something, although he was a dentist. Um, so, but I was brought up with fast cars. Uh, my mother was also was very good because she, my father, when he gave up racing, they together went as a team in, in trials and rallies, you know, up um, muddy hills and so on. So I was brought up with fast cars and my, both my mother and father were deeply connected. Because I was going to ask you, I mean, in those days there weren't sort of so many professional racing drivers about. I was going to ask where your father got the money, but you sort of answered that as a, as a dentist. What about your school days? I mean, when did you first take a real interest in motorsport? Uh, amazingly late, actually, when I think about it. I think it was probably when I was 15 or 16. I'd read Prince Bira's, well, Prince Chula Chakrabonsi's uh, book about uh, Prince Bira, who'd done a lot of racing as, an, as a semi-amateur you know, before the war. And, uh, you know, I thought, my gosh, it must be a really exciting life. And I went, to, I looked in the paper and I, f I happened to find a, an ad for a car that somebody was going to build, a 500cc Formula 3 car. Well, I'd got some money I'd won riding horses because I was allowed to keep any money I won. And I wrote a check for 50 quid as a deposit. My father happened to be going through my checkbook. He said, what's this? And I had to own up. And he was furious. I mean, he really, he said, no way you're going to be going to racing. We can't afford it. He, he, I had a Morgan three-wheeler at that time um, on the road, and he took that away. And, of course, I was chasing girls. And to go to for a meeting with a girlfriend on a bicycle was a, lot, a hell of a lot different than in a Morgan three-wheeler, you know. So um, I did have a struggle getting him to agree to let me have try it for a year, which I did. And uh, luckily, I was successful enough that a man called John Heath, who was racing in Europe, well, going to race a team in Europe, asked me if I'd like to join him. So what was the car that you were running with, uh, with John Heath at the time when, when you started racing with him? Yeah, well, that was the HWM. HWM, which stands for Hersham Walton Motors. And at the time, it was really, it was a bit, sir, obviously, a bit of this, bits of that. You know, it had an outer engine running on alcohol, I remember, and then a pre-selected gearbox, which obviously put the weight up. And we weren't really competitive against Ferrari or, or the Gordinis, for, in truth. But because we were English, the only green car out there, because I was very young, which is good from the point of view of, of getting start money and so on, um, we managed to sort of pay enough that, that John carried on and so I went all around Europe with him uh, and his cars and of course started driving sports cars with Jaguar as well. Back in those days, I mean nowadays Formula 1 drivers stick to Formula 1 and we've spoken about this with Sir Jack at times but back in those days sports car racing was every bit as big as Formula 1, probably even bigger. Yeah. Oh very much so, I mean uh, I mean, the t to have it as I did a contract with Jaguar of course was, a, was much as you can imagine much more remunerative and much better than having it with, with say HWM. Uh, it was totally different, I mean now of course drivers are expected to bring money or find money because of the sponsorship, um, the sponsorship deal uh, we we weren't allowed to i've never raced with any adverts on myself at all other than than dunlop or pirelli because that's that's all they, for whatever reason it was accepted that you could wear that you could put the name of your tire company on your overalls i don't know why this happened but it was uh, but otherwise you see i haven't had any of it advertising on my on my overalls at all there was this uh, before or just after the war? This was just after, just after the war. For I, I, the first event I ever did was in 1947, which was a, with a 328 BMW my father had uh, owned. And uh, he said, all right, you can have a go in a couple of hill climbs, because there was no racing as such, uh, because of the shortage of petrol. And, of course, we don't race on the roads in England. Then after that is when I went and joined uh, John Heath, got, got into Europe. So who were the people you were competing against at the time? You mentioned some of the cars like Ferrari and then Gordini. Who were some of the drivers? I mean, you've got people like Ascari and Farina and Villarese. Uh, I mean, really, there were some, uh, at the time, there were some extremely good drivers, very, very good drivers. You mentioned a, a couple of people there. As Ascari is one of the famous names, of course, and his name sort of lives on today. Most people will know of, of his name. What sort of, a, what sort of a competitor was he? Oh, I mean, he was, he had a, uh, much faster and better car, if you like, than mine. He, he was driving for the Alpha team, and you, the Alpha team had got he and Farina and 
I think Fagioli, I forget now. And then, of course, you've got the Gordini team when you've got the French people who are very good. And then you had the English ones, and we were there really to make up. We occasionally would get a third place. I mean, that's about better than we would have hoped for, though, really. You were moved on in uh, after that. You sort of moved on into the fifties, and you started to to really make a, a profile for yourself with uh, Mercedes, amongst other people. We're going to take a break now, and in pit lane with Sterling Moss. And when we come back, we're going to find out all about racing in the nineteen fifties and the famous era with Mercedes. Welcome back to In Pit Lane. Our guest is Sir Sterling Moss. Sterling, after the, uh, the your original time back in the 1950s, particularly in the mid 50s, you raced for Mercedes, and as you said, it wasn't that far that long after the war. Was there any uh, was there any problems in those days about a young English driver racing for a German team? Well, I, I was in those days very patriotic. I mean, we had some reason to be so because uh, I'm terribly pro English and everything. Well, now of course there's no such thing as patriotism, but then I only wanted to drive green cars. And and I can remember it quite well, actually, when it was suggested by Alfred Neubauer to my father, when my father spoke to him and said, will you try me out, you know, if give me a test. He said, look, we've seen how well he can do on, on pretty moderate cars. We really would like to see how well he can go on a decent car and to see whether he'd drive for, for Mercedes next year. Now, we're talking now 1954. And his, Neubauer's suggestion was that we got a, a competitive vehicle, so the only place we could go where they'd sell cars, because Ferrari didn't sell them, he raced, uh, was to Maserati. So my father went to Maserati and we managed to negotiate to buy a car and uh, they, they would look up, well they wouldn't look after it but they would keep it up to date. In other words, if they had a modification, they would allow me to purchase it and put on my car. So that's how it really worked. So what model Maserati was that? Was that the 250F or was this beforehand? Uh, 250F, which um, was fantastic. I mean, obviously every year the car was changed. You know, you've got the short wheelbase and the Piccolo and the lightweight and the God knows what. But in principle, the 250F was a really nice, good Formula One car. Not as reliable, maybe, or well, as well built as a Ferrari, but a, but a really, really nice car to drive. You mentioned Ferrari a couple of times. I understand that uh, Enzo Ferrari, you didn't exactly hit it off with uh, Enzo Ferrari, first of all. No, I didn't because when, uh, this is when I was 20 years old. And, you know, when, when you heard Ferrari, boy, you crossed yourself and faced Modena. And I had an in invite to go down and drive the new car, which was a four-cylinder, because all his were 12. And uh, to drive this little place called Bari in southern Italy. So, of course, I went with my father and said, this is fantastic. Went down there, found the garage, and, got, and I knew the car because it was for only four-cylinder uh, Ferrari. And I got in and I'm sort of fiddling around and the mechanic said, what are you doing? I said, well, my name's Sterling Moss and I'm driving this. Is oh, he said, I'm sorry, you're not. I said, what do you mean I'm not? He said, well, I'm saying Taruf is driving it. Well, the Taruf is a good driver and nothing against him. But I thought Ferrari was pretty bad not to have told me and I really felt very teed off. And I, I sort of vowed I'd, I'd never race for him. And in fact, I, I did race a Ferrari on, on 14 occasions with considerable success. I won four, t uh, 12 of the races, actually, uh, but uh, never for Ferrari, always uh, private cars. So until just before the end of my career in 61, he called me up and said, would I mind going to see him? And which, of course, I did. I flew down to, to Modena Maranello. I saw him and he said, look, tell me what car you want. I'll build it for you and uh, I'd like to support you and everything else. And so I told him I wanted a 246, which was the car then, uh, which he built. And I wanted it painted in Rob Walker blue because he was my patron, the guy I drove for, with a white band around the nose. And in fact, he did that. But unfortunately, of course, I had my crash and that ruined it. Now, 1955 was a, was a, a, an amazing year for you. You won many things, the uh, Mille Miglia, the, uh, the Tourist Trophy. Was the Tourist Trophy back in those days almost as good for a British driver as winning the Grand, British Grand Prix? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Mille Miglia, the Targa Florio and the, and the, and the TT were all, all the, the, the highest echelon of sports cars, and therefore they carried, I think, the same amount of points for the BRDC Gold Star. And, of course, they, they were respected by everybody, so they were very important. Yeah, very important. Now, in those days, you were racing with with Mercedes, and uh, you had a teammate called Fangio, one of the one of the legends. Uh, what sort of a what sort of a driver was he, and why was he so successful? 
to my mind, Fangio is the greatest Formula One driver who ever lived. I mean, absolutely tremendous. It's difficult to compare him with, say, if you like, some of the modern ones because times are different. I mean, now, now motor racing, thank God, is very safe than it wasn't. It was very dangerous. It's a different mindset. But he was an absolute gentleman, charming guy. Regrettably, he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak Spanish. So we, we got away with sort of hands and things like that. We're only talking about cars and crumpet, let's face it. So we'd be talking using our hands and, and like that. But, but a, a lovely man. Really. And in both cases, it's an international language, cars and crumpet. It doesn't matter what language you speak. Somehow we manage to understand each other, don't we? Exactly. I mean, he, he really was a, 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 a super guy from Argentina. And uh, uh, I, I had greatest respect. Funnily enough, for whatever reason, I could beat him in sports cars, but not in Formula One. And to me, Formula One is the pinnacle. You know, that's the thing to do. Well, you did beat him in one Formula One race, so your first Formula One race, which was the British Grand Prix. There was some conjecture at the time that he, he may have done a gentlemanly thing and pulled over. He always denied that very vehemently. What do you think? I don't know. I, honestly, and truly, when we'd finished, I said to him, I said, you, did, you, did you let me do it? And he said, it was your day. Now, how can I tell from that? I mean, what I do know is that he got a, we, the race started and he got quite a good uh, lead on him myself. I caught him up when he was being being have difficulty passing a back marker and then I managed to get into the lead because I forget exactly why and I went as hard as I could and he was behind me and when we finished up I came around the last corner I remember so well around the last corner at Aintree and I pulled over and I raved him through on the inside with my foot flat on the floor and I thought well, boy if you pass me out of that corner then my, your car's half faster than mine and of course it wasn't they built the best car they could and so I won by half a car length so I still haven't got an answer really well, obviously, there's more to come. We're going to take another break now on In Pit Lane. Our special guest is Sir Sterling Moss, and we'll be right back after this. Well, we're talking once again with Sir Sterling Moss, and Sir Sterling, we talked about uh, some of the good things of 1955. One of the, I suppose, one of the bad things that will live on forever is the 1955 Le Mans 24-hour race. Now, you were actually leading that race at the time when the word came through from Mercedes to uh, that they were going to pull out. What are your memories of that race, and how did you feel when they uh, when they made that decision? Well, I must say, in truth, I was very much against the decision. I couldn't see any point. I mean, we're talking about four o'clock in the morning now, so a, lot, a long time after. It certainly couldn't bring anybody back to life. And I thought, well, you know, why do it? I mean, what's, what's the reason? It was, it was actually uh, old John Fitch who said, call the directors where I think we should retire. I don't know why. I think it was a mistake all along. The course affected me because it was a very important race, you know. And uh, Fangio and I certainly had it in the bag. I mean, we had, I think, four, four laps lead uh, at that time. And Hawthorne and Buib in the Jaguar, we were certainly could cope with them because we, I mean, we didn't have the brakes they did, but we had superior power and we had the air brake and everything. So it was, uh, I, no, I just was very disappointed, frankly. But I, I could understand what he's saying, but I don't think it would help, was helpful. Were you aware? I mean, obviously you're focusing on the race at the time. Were you aware of the scope of the tragedy when you were out there? Oh, yes. It was absolutely appalling. I mean, we were standing on the pits waiting to take over. And Fangio went through and then Hawthorne came across and he pulled in across poor old Lance Macklin and then Levesque went up the back. I mean, it was a dreadful set of circumstances. And I can remember so well sort of seeing this car flash across. And it was... Obviously, they, they wanted people not to panic. They wanted to get the ambulances in and so on and so forth. And it was absolutely disaster. And I, I can't see what anybody could have done to have improved the, the, the situation, really. So ultimately, you think the ACO made the right decision continuing the race? Oh, I, I'm sure they did. Uh, you see, it, otherwise, you've got a quarter of a million people all saying, oh, I'm going home. And the ambulances couldn't get in and out. I mean, the, in those days, I don't think we even had an, uh, an air ambulance. You know, I don't think they existed in that time. Moving forward, uh, jumping forward a considerable amount back into the uh, into the into the 60s, you had your uh, your big crash. After I mean that's been very well documented. Afterwards, you came back and you you drove once again. Uh, were reasonably competitive in terms of the time, but you basically said no, not ready yet. Or what was the reason? What did you feel at the time? It was a 
awful decision, quite easily made because it was the only one I think I should have made. Um, it was awful because I really wanted to go back into the sport I knew. But the trouble I found going round, my concentration hadn't come back. That's the, that is the big thing. And therefore I was going into the course, I knew exactly what I should do, but I wasn't doing them automatically. It's rather like if I s swing at you like this and you don't duck, you're going to realise there's something wrong. Well, it was a bit like that. And, and I thought, well, you know, this is terrible. I think I should, in hindsight, if I'd waited three years, I think maybe and my concentration would come in all right. But the times change. I mean, you've got uh, Jimmy, uh, Jack, uh, Jimmy Clark, of course, came through. Uh, cars changed. We went to slicks and so on. And it just wasn't a viable proposition. So I made a decision that was easy to make at the time, which I think probably was the right one. Well, you made something of a comeback to racing, particularly in his stories, but also uh, Australia figures in uh, in that as well. With uh, with uh, I think it was an L34, perhaps an A9X Tirana, with uh, with our friend Sir Jack Brabham. What do you remember? How did that all come about? Well, I'll tell you. Jack and I, of course, were great great enemies on the track. We're good friends off it and so on. And uh, when I was offered the, the idea of driving with Jack, I thought terrific. And I said to Jack, I said, Jack, every race I've ever been in with you, you go before the flag's even fallen. So. Uh, and you're in Australia. If you jump the start, they're not going to worry too much. So you you go first, you see. And Jack's there. And I'm expecting him to go off like a ruddy ra rabbit, you know. And for whatever reason, he stalled on the line. Of course, somebody behind bashed the back end up and did our car quite a bit of damage. So it really it came to nothing. But it, I have to laugh at the situation. I mean, here were the two, the Jack and myself together in the same car. And I th hope hope to like to think with a chance of success. It came to nothing beyond the start line, really. And of course, it was a, I, th I think it was a triumph that actually sort of took you out. So a bit of a uh, bit of British uh, justice there taking you out in the end. Oh, I didn't realise what it was actually. Triumph Dolomite, if I remember correctly. Ah, well, I, well, you you remember better than I do. I can't. Remember. If I look in my diary, I probably confirm it. Yes. Let's move on to the to, to modern. Now you keep abreast with what is happening around. What do you think of the sport today? I mean, the, probably the major change you mentioned advertising before has been brought about by a man who's who's not a driver. He was very briefly, but a, f a fellow called by the name of Bernie Eccleston. What do you think of the direction he's taken the sport in? I, he gets a lot of flack, and I must say that uh, I think he's really done a lot for motor racing. I mean, you can't blame him for when there's money coming in, taking a lot of it, which he did, and fair enough. Uh, but if you look at the form one now wherever they go everything is so neat the trucks are all lined up I mean it is really it's a very slick operation so I think that's great it wouldn't it's not the sort of racing that I enjoy because I, I much prefer the older type cars and the way racing was but you you can't go backwards I mean it's as simple as that and I think I think considering the way it is uh, the the biggest problem we have you see the cars are now all so good that the driver input towards success is reduced not because they haven't got the ability because they have but because the cars when you start at such a high plane that's why you get the whole field maybe covered by two seconds which is ridiculous really because the drivers obviously there is a much bigger gap than that would indicate I mean between the people like you know Mark Webber for instance and the, and the slower guy there is really quite a big gap but it doesn't show up do you think that in this day and age with the intense media scrutiny, how do you think you uh, would have gone? I mean, we saw Lewis Hamilton here at the Australian Grand Prix. He did a burnout leaving the track and he was written up as if he'd robbed a bank or something. I mean, how do you think you'd go in the days of yourself and Graham Hill and Jim Clark and all those people after the race, having a few drinks after the race and uh, enjoying yourself and enjoying the crumpet, as it were? <laughs> Yeah, well, it, you, I suppose you have to live with the time, you know. I mean, it, it, I, I don't understand it. I don't... I don't. I really don't think I'd have fitted in that well, to tell you the truth. I mean, I race because I love racing, and when I had to, when I had to give it up and work for a living when I was 32, it nearly killed me. I mean, the idea of not doing what I love doing and then having to go out and work instead is, is appalling. So I reckon I had the best time that you could get. I think the quality of life. Um, of, say between if you like Lewis and myself is enormous I mean my quality is like far higher I mean when when the race is over I go off chasing crumpet what does he do he has to go to Vodafone and give <laughs> talk to them I mean you can't compare it can you really although I have seen the standard of Lewis's crumpet and it's very very nice thank you very much <laughs> that's very very true I must admit that's very yes he's got a good one there <laughs> well, it's been an absolute honour and a privilege. I mean, as, as we say, it's so hard sort of finding the little bits to take out. There's so much we could talk to you about, but you're, you're very busy. Thank you for giving up your time with us here uh, on In Pit Lane today. But for now, Sir Sterling Moss, thanks for joining us in Pit Lane. Thank you, and I look forward to our next trip to Australia because we have a lovely time here. Really do.